Hello, can everyone hear me? This is Delenn Danes, the moderator for this uh, session. Please type in chat if you can hear me. Okay, it appears that everything is live right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 9.30 a.m. breakout session of the Open Simulator Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org, and you can post your questions in local chat on the Ustream chat or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce Buddy Sprocket, who will be presenting virtual culture heritage projects for teaching collaborative virtual environments. Daniel Livingstone teaches computer games technology at the University of the West of Scotland. A co-founder of Sludo, Daniel has been involved in a wide range of teaching and research initiatives in virtual worlds. Daniel is also on the Board of Governors of the European Immersive Education Initiative. Welcome, Daniel, a.k.a. Buddy Sprocket. Hi there. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so some nice to see uh, a small audience here and maybe some other people watching streaming. And nice again to see a few people I've not met for quite a long time. Some old friends from Second Life here. Um, so, um, nice to see you today. So, if you've seen me talk before, this is something completely different. Um, I'm really going to be talking about uh, some of our most recent work, basically from my teaching. So, this is really something much more from a teaching point of view than a research one. Um, and I've been teaching a class in collaborative virtual environments, which is an academic term, and it covers things like virtual worlds, but essentially where they're often in a, where they're designed for collaboration, often where they're designed for a particular purpose, or really where the interest is, how do people collaborate in these environments? Um, and the research does go back over the past couple of decades, so there is a, a distinct area, a distinct sort of field of research around collaborative virtual environments. And as the virtual worlds and the collaborative use of virtual worlds falls into that as well. And in terms of collaborative virtual environments, I think we can consider something like Second Life or Open Simulator as a platform. So that's the basic, uh, the software technology which we can use to develop a CDE for a particular group or task. Uh, thank you, Ellie. Um, so I should actually just say, well, if you've got any questions, I'm keeping chat open and I'll try and catch questions at the in chat uh, and I'll try and come to them as they come up. And obviously more time for questions and answers at the end. I'll try not run away too long. Um, it's not just the basic features of a platform that define a part of virtual environment, but really the 3D environment that's created, the sort of tools that are embedded in that environment to support collaboration, but also, and I've not really said that here, but also the processes and procedures and ways in which people use the platform are all about how people use it to collaboratively. In particular, I mean, as an example to get started with, we can think of the Open Simulator Community Conference environment that we're in right here as a particular form of collaborative virtual environment. And you can see here around us, we have an environment that's set up for a very particular form of collaboration. We don't, it's not set up for everyone here to work together and do brainstorming. It's set up for me to sit at the front and give a talk. We've got all these conference and presentation tools set in. Uh, there are permissions that have been very carefully configured so that I can use this um, presentation tool and hopefully random people uh, just logging in can't take over the presentation. We've got all sorts of permission settings that have been set up for that within the greater conference environment or other discussion areas and breakout areas where people can perhaps go off the chat 
and there's also export areas. So this has been developed using Open Simulator, but effectively there's tools and environments that can set up on top of that to support particular types and forms of collaboration. So I'll tell you a little bit about the class I had. It was a final year class. Uh, some students were taking the class because they had to, some students picked it as an option. The class studied a wide range of collaborative virtual environments and related tools from groupware, uh, slightly dead term, not really used so much, uh, things like Google Docs, and all the way through to virtual worlds, so a wide range of collaborative tools. The class covered theory and practice. So theory was mostly evaluated through an essay Except it was also a little bit practical because it had to be a collaborative, collaborative written essay. So two people had to write it together and they had to collaborate online. In many cases, the students working together in the essay were actually from different campuses and didn't necessarily actually meet in person at all. They still had this essay to write together. Much more practical element uh, was to develop a CVE using a virtual world platform. And I also wanted to give them a meaningful goal to aim for in terms of what they were going to develop, what they were going to create. And I worked with a local sort of voluntary organisation. Um, so one of our campuses is based in the town of Paisley, which is uh, on the west coast of Scotland. It's a very historic town. Uh, in terms of there's an abbey in the town that dates back to the 13th century uh, but the town more recently more recent history about the last hundred years ago was an important industrial town a lot of the industry has died away and moved away from the town so we have essentially a town that has some need of urban regeneration but is also a town that's got quite a rich heritage both uh, medieval historical heritage and also an industrial heritage as well. So it's quite an interesting, I think, historic town with, with this recent industrial history, but it's also a town that's got many areas of deprivation, many areas that are not quite poor, and many areas that are quite badly in need of redevelopment. So that picture is actually quite a nice picture of the town, but you can maybe see that just behind the town hall you might be able to see some modern 60s concrete block buildings that are also dotted around the place. We worked with a group called Plan for Paisley uh, to develop a brief for the student projects and the brief was to investigate and develop a prototype of a collaborative virtual environment that would support public participation in the planning process. So it's about creating a 3D interactive model of the town centre or an area of the town centre and um, allow members of the public to come in and use that as well as for discussion. Um, I think there's a, there's, it's, yeah, it's not, I don't think this is necessarily a unique use of virtual worlds but there's one that is, is fair relevance so it's where the main campus and majority of the students in the class were based at the Paisley campus so it was a location they know well and it's I guess a location that they also can appreciate is has some definite need of, of, of development so you can see a real purpose behind the, the work that we're doing in the 3D environment. Um, there's some notes there that the project can be extended or could be extended as a kind of marketing or interactive front end for tourism. So there are other potential uses. We had six groups of students. Uh, most of the groups were drawn from two different campuses. This was quite deliberate. We actually and slightly unusual class in that we actually had classes for on two different campuses at the same time. This was really forcing them to collaborate virtually and collaborate online because 
they were all based in the same camp, they were all in the same room. And as I say, for most of the groups where they had students on multiple campuses, they never met in person, they only ever met online, whether using email, Google Docs to collaborate and plan, other online technologies using Skype, or indeed in the virtual world themselves. Students worked in a range of different platforms. Uh, there was one project that was using Google Earth. That project, for other reasons, was incomplete, so it won't come up again in the presentation. Uh, the remaining projects were in Second Life. There were two projects in the Simulator running on the Jokadia grid. There was one project in Open Wonderland on a server running at the university. And there was one project running in Minecraft. So it's quite a range of platforms. And really, what the, one of the nice things about that is from this range of projects, what can we learn of the relative advantages and disadvantages of each? And I know these have studied before, but the platforms do change over time. Open Sims are constantly being developed. But in terms of the educational setting or for this particular type of purpose, what advantages and disadvantages of each has, does each platform give us? And we have to take into account, considering this, that the teams might not necessarily be actually using the platforms very well. These are all students. This is a, a project where they're learning what they send the learning second life. They're learning about online collaboration at the same time as they're learning to use these tools to create an environment. So we don't necessarily expect these projects to be showing the platforms to their fullest potential, uh, just as well, perhaps. And so I'm going to show you a range of pictures of Paidly now, as seen through these different platforms and as developed by the students. In Second Life, we had a group. The group developed a few different areas of Second Life. This is from an area representing Paisley High Street. Um, I would say that the team working in Second Life left a lot of their modelling activity to quite late. We didn't get an early start on this work. A lot of the modelling work was quite primitive, um, and a lot of the detail was, was perhaps lower than, than it could have been. But it's a recognisable representation of the Paisley High Street. first open simulator group certainly got a much earlier start. They did a nice thing to help them with the planning. They, they took Google Maps images and they basically plastered of those around the ground, covering the entire ground of the map of the half sim that they had to work in, and then used that as a reference for building up from there. And they built a more extensive map, a 3D environment, they covered several streets from the city centre and they used mainly textures from photos and from images from Google Street View to actually cover the buildings with actual photos or actual images of the buildings as seen. So a lot of the building and modelling there is very simple. You could model an entire building city block with basically a cube, but with the actual texture that represents it. So it's quite very quick to do. It gives a reasonable visual uh, fidelity. Um, the second open simulator group put a lot more effort and detail into focusing on two particular buildings in Paisley. Um, we have the Paisley Town Hall, uh, which we saw in the earlier photo. And it wasn't in the earlier photo, but behind it you can see here um, just cropped out there is the Paisley Abbey, uh, which is 13th century, a very historical abbey. The abbey in particular here was modelled with a great attention to detail and was really a quite impressive piece of work. They modelled the river behind uh, the town hall and a little bit of the landscaping in the area around there. But not, not much else in terms of the actual, the actual town. Open Wonderland was, a, was unusual in that 
makes an odd comparison because I think the avatars in the Open Wonderland are, are very basic compared to the avatars that are available in Second Life or Open Sim. Uh, but the models, for, so that's the High Street again, it's the uh, same section of High Street as we saw in the previous picture. It was much, uh, as in, sorry, in the Second Life picture, it was modelled much, much more, with much better visual detail because they were able to take models from Google 3D Warehouse that third-party uh, and it modelers had already created and posted online of key landmarks and buildings in, in the town. Um, the Collada models can also be imported to Second Life, but it was only the Open Wonderland group uh, that were successful in importing Collada models because it's a, a much simpler operation in Open Wonderland. So the avatars look a lot more basic, and interaction with the environment sometimes seems a lot more constricted in the Wonderland, but the environment itself we were able to build was of a quite high quality. And then there was Minecraft, uh, which was a very, very different thing again, because uh, I don't know, so how many people here have actually played around in Minecraft or, or been in Minecraft to use it for any purpose? No one? So, Minecraft is incredibly popular. Um, incredibly, incredibly popular uh, with uh, probably a younger demographic than, than uses Second Life and Open so. uh, No. Are uh, many millions of users, um, and amongst it, the education community around Minecraft focus a lot on its the ability to use it for collaboration, which is why it was an interesting one to include here um, in terms of what facilities for collaboration are there in Minecraft. Um, and so, what these students here, we built a few different zones. What's shown here is one of us, a hall of residence. So student accommodation within within Paisley. Quite a new building and that's quite recognisable that building even though it's quite a blocky representation of it. So we had four different platforms that were being used, five projects with four platforms. And to an extent what happened in those different platforms? Uh, so, yeah, so, so some some people have used Minecraft a lot, and I think if you've used Minecraft, you will know well the big differences. But at the same time, across all the projects, a lot of things came out the same, but different, if you will. So all platforms were quite effective for the teams themselves to collaborate, to develop some kind of collaborative virtual environment. All groups were successful at developing 3D environments that recognisably represented areas of the town. So, in some cases, students modelled much more smaller areas than larger areas. They chose different areas to model, but they were all successful in developing 3D environments. were very recognisable to an all that knows the town, basically, to, to be able to identify exactly where and please they were modelling. This was quite good because other than Minecraft, the students have no prior experience in any of these environments. So, um, I, should, I should say again, for, for Minecraft, the students used creative mode, so there were no monsters. There were no monsters in the Minecraft that we made here. There is, there is the, the creative mode, which I think makes sense for, for some application. Um, so, I, I think there are other previous people, other previous work has shown that open sim or second life can be used for rapid prototyping of different environments and games and so on. And again, this is just really supporting that and it's something that's different. Um, where there was the biggest difference between the projects was if we actually think about who the end users are supposed to be. The students were not supposed to be just developing an environment and then 
standing around it and looking and saying, hey, I look at our one, isn't it neat? In principle, they were given a brief where there were end users in mind. And end users were going to be stakeholders in urban regeneration. So public participation in urban planning and urban regeneration is a, is a goal that was there in the brief. And this is where the biggest differences were. But once you've developed that environment, what features does that have for people to use it for collaboration and discussion and other types of interaction to collaborate? And that was really quite varied. So, for example, without significant modification, Minecraft in particular is very poor here. Uh, the system for someone, a member of the public, to come in and comment on what was there required finding a book dispenser, getting a book, opening the book, and then using quite a clunky interface to type in a comment, and then leave that in a chest, and then someone, some moderator, would have to go in, log into the environment, find that chest, open it, look to see if there were any books in there, open the books, and then read them. So it was a very, very awkward commenting system within the world, so it was very difficult for end users to come in and to comment on or interact with the environment there. And the permissions are very much all or nothing. So users either had permissions to, to just use these books for commenting and nothing else other than discussion, or they would have permission to completely tear apart the world and, and, and potentially vandalise it or ruin it. And in terms of features for web integration, again, Minecraft was much poorer here without addition of modification. Um, so very good for web integration or, or pulling in information or linking to other systems. That's one of the key differences. And I developed a, a brief table, not so necessarily what the capabilities are of the platforms, but really what the team has built out of each. So as I've noted, for a range of the buildings in the Paisley High Street area and the key landmarks, Town Hall and the Abbey, Google 3D Warehouse, um, yeah, the Google 3D Warehouse has models that other people have posted online already that are free to reuse. Uh, and in principle, these can be imported into Second Life, and I think Openson, if you have things set up correctly, you've got the right server version and the right browser version, but only Open Wonderland was able to touch the users. So the 3D fidelity, the 3D quality of the built environment was excellent in Open Wonderland. Not so good in the Open Seven and Second Life. And I think being good at building with prims is something that takes a long time to learn. Um, and so I think the Open Sim project, in this case, came came out with better quality work than Second Life, but using the exact same tools. And Minecraft we, we build using blocks. So the 3D quality, you can recognise things, but it's certainly not going to be for detail. Um, and if you wanted to do things like add lights for night environments, it's got very specific and limited ways in which you can do that, but you don't necessarily work well with the realism. Um, and more interesting was Despite the brief, students would perhaps focus on building a 3D environment and not really consider how the environment was to be used. Although there was a heavy emphasis on throughout the class on processes and people as being important features of collaboration. So bizarrely, only two of the five environments due to the developers had in specific areas of the environment for people to have a discussion, or areas like this to have a presentation. So both open sim uh, projects were taking place on the one sim in Jokadia grid. So I suspect there's an element of, if one group had a good idea, the other group probably spotted that and thought we should do that too. Um, a little bit of variation in, the, in one group, discussion and presentation areas were, were embedded in the 3D model of the town hall. So the town hall had the presentation area and the discussion areas. In the other, the 
project, the worst separate discussion of presentation area is built out with the sort of 3D models. And, um, everyone except for Minecraft was able to have links to the web, so you could click on things and be taken to web pages. Um, the Open Some projects didn't use the parcel media. Parcel media is a little bit awkward for people just learning about building. And a second life, the uh, media in a prim was much, much more well supported. I'm not quite sure if it was just uh, failed to find the features in, in OpenSim or if it was to do with the versions of the clients that were using. It was only really in the second life that the web and world was extensively used. Um, I've in terms of tools for the public to use, you know, was bearing in mind that this was evidence, this was the target audience, was members of the public to come in. Our Second Life group had a web forum that was available on our web page in Second Life. Uh, OpenSim groups, perhaps the best OpenSim first group, had in world voting tools, they had collaborative writing tools that were available in Second Life, and uh, in OpenSim, sorry. And they actually had considered ways in which people might actually work together to discuss things, come up with ideas, share ideas, and vote on things. So you could vote, wander around and vote on uh, areas. And I think one category I've not listed to is information boards. They almost all had information displays around, around so all projects had information displays. But only one group really had more collaborative tools present. I thought it was odd to note that these tools weren't used in Open Wonderland. Many of these tools are actually built in features of Open Wonderland, so they're actually very easy to add to the Open Wonderland environment because it's just drag and drop. You just say, I, I, I want a collaborative whiteboard here, and it's there. You don't need to go in and, and buy one from a store or anything. Um, the next the other sad thing to note from the previous is that technology issues still cause lots of problems. Um, I've been using virtual worlds uh, in my teaching on and off for, let me see, since about 2006, so we're kind of maybe seven years. Um, and I'm still having problems with technology and things breaking and things not working at all. We had initially tried to host OpenSim ourselves, but some of them with our network address servers uh, and conflicts within the university network prevented us from being able to do this. So we were able to run OpenSim and host it, but and, and do everything worked until we tried to connect to it and do a client, at which point things failed. So that was not very, very effective or useful. Um, Having spoke to Fleet Took, uh, well, where that she'd encountered some of the similar issues when she was first setting up her open sim, so we knew it wasn't just us. We had some ideas from her and she'd overcome it in her institution. We overcame it by, by getting third party hosting. Uh, we have a very restrictive institutional security policies for services that have been done on servers in the university. And that essentially effectively blocked off students from having access to the Wonderland from outside campus. And this, this is a um, not not ideal if you've got a collective virtual environment. You see people, but you still need to come into university if you want to use it. Uh, in the time available, we were unable to get uh, Minecraft ports opened. Um, again, there was a mixture of firewall issues, but also some of the related policy works at the university in terms of having to know the IP address um, of the servers we're connected to outside, and Minecraft was not being hosted on a, on a set of servers, so we can resolve that in time. Perhaps because we've been using Second Life since 2006, the problems with access for Second Life have long since been solved, and very similar settings are required for access to OpenSim that's hosted outside the university. I'm sorry, I've just spotted the type on the slide. So we actually had no problems at all with Second Life <coughs> or OpenSim in terms of the technology. Uh, <coughs> using the third party host.
Um, and what I also see still is we still have issues of complexity. So I think probably the very first time I ever gave a talk about teaching in Second Life, I noted that it was a very complex environment and that students find there's an awful lot of stuff to learn and it takes them a long time and they get lost and confused. And I think that's really still true and I know that a lot of effort we're going to do is to simplify and improve the user interface. Essentially, we still have a very steep learning curve. There's social issues, navigational issues, technological issues. So just one example of this is the model of Paisley Abbey that was built, which I've since modified slightly, but I, I kind of gave up because it was being too time consuming. It was modelled to look very good. So it was very, quite visually detailed, but it was a very naive approach to development. So uh, let me know what your thoughts on this are. We've got a model of an abbey. It used approximately 2,000 crims and not, and none of those crims were linked at all. So we have a highly detailed model built out of about 2,000 unlinked prints in, in OpenSim. So if anyone here is a builder in OpenSim, just just think about just have a, have a thought of that. That's probably giving you uh, sh the shakes. Just trying to imagine that. And I think that was, the key thing is that was probably the most detailed and visually the best piece of work out of all of my projects <coughs> was that model of Paisley Abbey. Uh, so as a student put in an awful lot of time um, into doing that, but we can see that the complexity is not just how to use the tools, but how to use them well and how you should use them. Um, and subtle things like ways of actually just linking things together and how to use and reuse the linked objects in, in larger scale buildings are things that can take quite a lot of time to learn um, and was really beyond the you know, students' ability within, within this project. <clears throat> we also had a very significant donation in the collaborative features provided in CV despite in some cases very similar platform capabilities. So I think if I can go back to the table, in terms of the, the features available, Second Life and OpenSIM are very similar, but if you compare the Second Life and the two OpenSIM projects, the collaborative tools and the ways in which members of the public could come in and use these environments to discuss planning changes or to discuss or learn about um, were very varied. So again, that's partly that they're learning building tools, they're learning how to use environments, at the same time as learning about all the different tools that can be used within those environments. Uh, so I'm going to end really quite early here. Um, but, uh, so to end with these general points. I think the cultural heritage of a local environment is a very rich application for a virtual world. So it's not by any means a unique. So at the very first uh, Second Life Community Conference, there was a paper on virtual Morocco, which is a, again a virtual, a, a virtual heritage uh, and social application. Um, and these can be very engaging and can be very relevant to students. In this case, I was very hands-off, so I wasn't involved in the building at all of any of these environments. So we probably had less mentoring, less direct mentoring in terms of the building and development skills. That's partly a consequence of the fact we had six different environments to support, sorry, five different environments to support and for people to work with. Uh, the learning curve is very steep, so when students are new to these environments, it's what not to underestimate the amount of learning required. If I was able to clone myself and do much more mentoring in terms of working much more closely with people and helping them learn how to use all the tools effectively for building in open and second life, that would be helpful. Um, but it's not just the technology. Uh, and students working in these projects, and not just students, but anyone working in these projects, 
it's not just a case of build something that looks right. We need to really think about and emphasise the importance of thinking about how the environment is supposed to be used, how users are expected to interact in a collaborative virtual environment, and how that use is supported. Um, <clears throat> and so that's it. Thank you. Um, and if you've got any questions, let me know. The class ran for, so the question was, how long were students involved for? Was it one semester? It was a one semester class. Um, the class ran a total of 12 weeks. The students probably more like, had more like six or seven weeks to actually develop these. In the end, the environments have not been tested by the public. Some are some of the environments are still available, so um, the, one of the issues are with varying of these. So I think the Minecraft environment is available for download. I should look out the, the link for that if I can find it. Um, so the people that developed the, min <coughs> the Minecraft environment actually provided the, the world as a file we could download. So if you anyone else with Minecraft could, could download and use that world. Um, but as I say, it doesn't feature much in the way of collaborative tools. With Second Life, the co the, one of the issues with Second Life I didn't mention is it cost a lot of money in Second Life. We no longer have a permanent presence in Second Life from the university, so it required me securing quite a large piece of land for students to work in uh, for the period of the class. So effectively, as soon as this was, was marked, uh, coincided quite closely with uh, the end of our rental, so everything disappeared in Second Life almost as soon as the class finished. Um, some of the open sim stuff we've got uh, our sim in Jokedia grid. Sim is uh, Paisley 2020. Uh, and I've not logged in recently, but um, if you go to Jokedi Grid and Paisley 2020, you should still be able to see the Paisley Abbey. Uh, and you'll see that I've actually tried modifying it a little bit and trying to start linking up bits of it, but then I got tired and bored. And so you'll see there's still, you know, vast numbers of trims of this unlinked build that's, that's still quite detailed. <coughs> <coughs> it would have, so, uh, so public testing it sadly wasn't there. I did share, actually what I'll say for public testing, for public testing one of the requirements of the project was all groups had to create a video of their work. So um, if you can give me a second I'll, I'll get you a video URL. this right. so I'll get you a video that just demonstrates one of the projects um, and then you can, you can see the kinds of things um, so not all these hosts are still working I need to make sure I pick one that's still up So yeah, all the students had to provide a website with a video, um, and so we can see we can see one of the websites. It's got a nice video embedded in it. Here, I'll actually bring this up here. And if 
to so the media should have come up there so you may be able to see behind me is one of the projects and we have within that you'll have to click on it uh, yourself everyone gets a copy of this web page there's a link there for a video demo and so they had a video that, that, that outlined this so the videos and the project homepages were all shared with uh, the representative from Paisley 2020 the, the sort of uh, voluntary group um, and so we've got some comments back that way rather than actually having the public empty to test these out. Um, so it was really my expert evaluation of, of what features need to be included for the public. But I could really see that for example for Minecraft if you didn't know how to use Minecraft you wouldn't be able to do anything in the Minecraft environment. Um, and I think we've all got some idea of how difficult Second Life and OpenSim can be for users. My personal evaluation is that if someone who's never used these environments, Open Wonderland is the easiest to log into and walk around and wander around and use. Um, and with Second Life and Open Sim, it also depends on the, how you get people started, but I think that's a kind of other issue. Um, how much, so <clears throat> let me go back over some of the other questions. Uh, how much of the problems were bureaucratic and how much technological? It's a mix. Um, running OpenSim ourselves is a technology issue because uh, we have had some support from IT trying to get it up and running, but there was something there that, that, that didn't work out. Um, let me try and find the Open Wonderland group, FC, if the page is still, still available. So some of the, the, the students hosted these on temporary sites that may no longer be, be available. You won't be able to log in to um, Open Wonderland uh, because it was only available from within the, the university. So here is the Open Wonderland group. Yeah. Um, so let me try to work through the questions. There are a few questions here, which is quite nice. Uh, were students fairly self motivated? It varied, as I say. The group that developed the Paisley Abbey were very motivated, they were very organised, they were very motivated. Uh, the group, the other group that was in open sim with them, was perhaps. I think when you're sharing a sim with a group that are really motivated and doing lots of work, you find that you have to do lots of work because because you can see what they're doing. You're like, oh my goodness, we've got to match what they're doing. So that drove that. that worked really. So both those groups in open sim side by side developing their their worlds probably did the most work and got to work earliest and were most organised. Second life group. <clears throat> left things far too late to get started and I think they could have achieved much better results than they did if they'd got started earlier and been more focused. Similarly Open Wonderland, to be honest, I think. Um, and I think that sometimes varies according to the groups of students. So some of the best students were the ones in one of the um, Open Sim groups and they were just very, very organised and driven students. Um, so student motivation is, 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 is all over the hard problem and it, and it varies often with students and so sometimes you find you've got a group of students in, in a virtual world and they're the most motivated you could do ever and sometimes sadly not. Um, um, in terms of exporting models for other environments, there are export tools to get stuff out of out of Second Life and um, In the past, I've actually tried to, to encourage students to, to think about export as the development, so make sure that one person uh, creates an object and has it with, with the permissions required to be able to export it. Uh, I didn't make that requirement this time. Um, 
Um, I'll share with you, I think I've got one other. One other project URL, so you can see the other open the other open sim group uh, project. So that's three of the project websites. And so you can maybe see some some variation there uh, in terms of the features and, and, and what what we got onto. I thought it was an interesting project. We got some good feedback from the from the uh, the partner and. Um, it was quite useful in terms of motivation, the fact that the person from this plan for Paisley group, the Paisley 2020 group, works for a, a, a recruitment agency. Certainly was, was, was an ability to give us some motivation, in fact, I was able to say that someone's going to be looking at this and we work for a recruitment agency uh, as a good thing for, for students in their final year. Uh, I think that's maybe it for, for questions. If there is anything else, you can always email me. Um, and drop me a, a personal email if you want to ask more questions. Um, um, I'll just give you, that's my personal email address. Just give me a signal, just drop me a line. Well, great. Thank you, buddy, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Next will be a conference break from 10.30 to 11.30. There will be a keynote address at 11.30. In this particular room, the next session will be at 12.30. El Secreto de El Balam, Building an Immersive Experience for Language Learners with James T. Abraham, a.k.a. AKA Callisto Encial in Second Life. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience. We'll be back after the break in the keynote with the next session.